Well, welcome to the Making Ideas Work podcast again. It is my absolute honor to welcome Jeff Got Health. Jeff, for me, you are like one of the world leading practitioners and thinkers around product, UX, business more recently as well. Jeff, a uh, huge welcome to the show. Uh, that's, that's very kind of you to say, Spencer. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Look, honestly, that is from my heart. That is tr so, totally true. You've shaped my career largely over the last goodness, 10 years, probably, um, and many people the same as well. But I want to hear your story, um, uh, you know, get these people to, to understand a little bit about your story as well. But first, like the, your Amazon bio says, right, Jeff helps organizations build better products and executives build the cultures that build better products. But I want to give you the opportunity to kind of bring that to life. What's your story? What do you do? And get people to really understand who you are to help us kind of shape the rest of this conversation. Sure. And I'll work backwards. So, so today I work as a, as a coach, a speaker, and a trainer for usually large organizations. That's not uh, exclusive, but usually it's, it's mid and certainly enterprise size organizations, helping them build great products like, like the, the bio that I, I might the elevator pitch that I worked on and, and for, for such a long time, I went through so many of those elevator pitch exercises, um, you know, and, uh, and, 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 but not like the, you know, my background is in design and in product management, um, and information architecture, if you go all the way back, but really it's not so much about how to design better per se, how to be a better designer in the, the craft of design or necessarily, but it's more along the lines of how do we build a, a customer centric approach to product development? How do we ensure that we are always working from a specific problem to solve? for the user or a goal that we're trying to achieve for the user. Um, and then how do we do that collaboratively as designers, product managers, software engineers, marketers, um, copywriters, et cetera, everybody who's kind of works on this kind of stuff. Um, and then, and so that's, that's kind of one half of it is that help teams build those. And then we do that through, you know, through again, speeches, probably uh, very exciting, but perhaps the, the, the least effective way to make change inspirational, you know, but, um, uh, but really a lot more through through training and coaching and, and teaching organizations. And then the other half of it is is helping leaders build cultures that support these ways of working. So if you go kind of back in time, I was a designer, web designer in the late 90s, when all you had to do to get a job in 1999 was spell HTML. Like when you could spell HTML, you <laughs> could get a job in 1999. It was crazy. Heady times, heady times to say the least, it was, it was really crazy. Like, I don't think we've really ever seen anything like it. Um, probably and, never will again, right? Yeah, probably not. But literally, <laughs> I, I could actually do a bit more than, than spell HTML, but not much more. And, you know, and, and I got a job. And, um, and, and or, as, I, uh, as I worked uh, kind of over, uh, my, my career started as, as web designer and then information architect and then UX designer and then team leader and then uh, design team leader and, and product manager and so forth. And when I was leading design teams, um, they, uh, I found myself in a situation where I needed to build a design team and get that team to work well in an agile software development environment, which was still relatively new. This is kind of mid to late 2000, so 2007, 2008. Agile's been around not even a decade at that point and really starting to pick up steam. Um, and, and the company where I worked was, was switching over to it. I had to build a team and we didn't know how to do it. And so I uh, was lucky enough to have a boss who allowed us to experiment with different ways of working. We managed to find an answer and then corroborate that answer to the Agile and UX, Agile and design question with other folks trying to solve the same issues. So folks like Janice Frazier, Josh Seiden, Alan Cooper, Jeff Patton, and even um, Desiree C, for example, who wrote the first sort of paper about this, this thing of, of dual track agile. And, uh, and in doing so, that, that sort of became the, the foundation for Lean UX, which was the first book that uh, Josh Seiden and I wrote together. And kind of coming back to my original point, I've been teaching Lean UX for a decade at least, if not more at this point. And inevitably, inevitably, without fail, 
the feedback has is consistent. Every almost with every class, at some point, somebody says, "This is great, Jeff. I want to work this way, but my boss won't let me work this way, or my company doesn't let me work this way." And so the whole building great products and building cultures that build great products is building great products is lean UX, right? That's that's kind of where that comes from. And then the other stuff that I've done since then, kind of in parallel, so Sense and Respond, the second book that we wrote together and the conversations that we're having today about um, objectives and key results, plus that little lean versus agile versus design thinking book that I wrote, all of that is designed to help leaders understand what they need to do to support teams so that those teams can build great products, right? So the, that pithy elevator pitch phrase is sort of a, a summation of the very practical, tactical stuff in Lean UX. Here is how to work collaboratively. Here is how to integrate design and research and everything else into sprints. Um, and then Sense and Respond and, and Lean versus Agile and, and OKRs is really focused on how, does the, how can the organization support that way of working? Um, and that, and to me, that's, that's kind of what I do, right? As a whole, I work with teams and I work with leaders to, to make those two things hopefully line up in a meaningful way. Hey, that makes so much, I had actually a question, which was pretty much exactly what you just described. And, you know, it, it felt as I was writing these, you know, starting to jot down some questions and looking, looking at the work that you've been focused on for the last 10 years that you'd, you'd kind of shifted from that individual product level up through the business, if you like, to the team yeah. up uh, until, I guess, you know, the full enterprise space that you're working in often now and much higher level, maybe with kind of C-suite executives or whatever else. And I was going to ask whether that was an intentional shift, but it also feels like it almost mirrored your career path as well, your career tra tra trajectory as a product person before kind of moving into the the author speaker kind of world that you're in now as well. So it feels like, uh, yeah, that was definitely an intentional it's an, an intentional. Yeah, I mean, look to, to be to, yeah, to be a bit uh, uh, tongue in cheek about it, but it's true, right? So we put out Lean UX, and we start to sense feedback about Lean UX, right? You put the stuff out into the world, whether people are consuming it through your speeches or your classes or your book or whatever podcasts, writing, etc., and then you start to sense feedback, and the feedback is, look, we love the idea. My company doesn't work this way, and so we responded, right? The whole sense and respond thing is deliberate, right? We responded to that feedback and said, okay, great. We need to have a conversation with the leaders of the organization. We need to figure out how to get folks to realize that they are running software-based businesses and that managing these software-based businesses is different. And that the way that you build successful digital products and services is different than you've done, you know, in the past. And so that's, it's, it's 100% deliberate and very sense and respond. Like, you know, we sense the feedback mm -hmm. and respond to it. That's really been the case ever since Lean UX came out. Yeah. So, um, and that sense of respond, I think that, that, that phrase for me now sticks so strongly when I think about so many different challenges, whether that be the kind of things that we're talking about in management, but also just, you know, the, obs the observation that you need to do with that early stage of any kind of discovery uh, work you know, you're looking and you're sensing, you're trying to figure out what people are thinking, feeling, sensing literally is that word constantly and, and responding to that word in the best way um, possible. I want to dig in if we can. I, I definitely want to get to the point where we start to talk about some of your latest thinking about OKRs and and and, and what it looks like in the, um, the organizational level. But why don't we try and bring to life, if you can, the kind of lean UX world for anyone that might not be familiar with that work you know, maybe set it in the kind of context of the day, but also why is it relevant today, which I think it still is incredibly relevant today, maybe with a little bit about, you know, the Lean UX canvas, if you think that's an interesting area to explore for people as well. So talk to us about that. What's, what's it all about? What was, um, what was, why was that needed at the time? Why do we think it's still, um, still relevant? Why do you think it may be still relevant now? Yeah. So, so look, Lean UX was a response to, needing to figure out how to do UX design work. So everything that falls under that umbrella in an agile software development environment, There's, there just wasn't a good answer. Um, and if we went looking for it, I, I mean, I wasn't trying to invent anything. 
I went looking for what other people had tried. And in the mid 2000s, when you went looking for answers to the Agile and UX question, it was a trail of tears, really. I mean, it was one blog post after another about failure or Agile sucks or this, there's no way these two things could ever go together. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, let's not even try. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it's like, I, I'm sorry that this failed for other folks, but I didn't have a choice. I had to figure this out because I was building a team. It was my, my second attempt at building a team at, at a different company, my second sort of management job, much, much bigger team this time around. And uh, I had to figure it out. And so we went, we went and looked at the anti-patterns, right? So if, if you can't get any, anything good, you look at least what's bad, right? And why is it bad? And then try to solve for, for the, the root causes of failure there. And so that was the initial set. And so when Lean UX first came out, it was super focused, like laser focused on how to do design in Agile. Like that was it. And it was, and it was about cross-functional teams, about shorter cycles, about just enough design work to move the conversation forward. It was about uh, building research into every sprint, building some kind of experimentation to every sprint. Um, and, and it was about, in some sense, pushing for a redefinition. Perhaps it wasn't so deliberate in Lean UX first edition, it's in its third edition now, um, but I, it wasn't as deliberate as it is now but in pushing for a redefinition of done, so that like the mm -hmm. scrum definition of done and a redefinition of, well, scrum fundamentals to some extent, right? So if, you, if you're sort of a, a religious scrum person, um, you know, there is a belief that you've got to ship working code at the end of every sprint, right? And so that would lead you to believe that then you have to ship complete designs every sprint. And that's where the breakdown was. And so we took that on, I think, uh, to some extent as well in Lean UX. It was all about sort of, hey, instead of like disappearing behind your monitor for a three-month design phase in a waterfall process, here's what needs to change for designers to survive in this new agile world. That was Lean UX 1. Now, every five years, we've been lucky enough to be able to rewrite it um, or to update it. And so we did second edition um, I'll be honest with you, the, mo the most revelatory part of, of writing the second edition was going back and reading the first edition after a couple of years, because I, you know, I don't <laughs> sit around reading UX every day. Um, and I was mortified, <laughs> mortified. I was like, I cannot believe they published this. Like the, the, I was like, you know, just in my own, like, you know, because, because look, writing is like a muscle. Right. Um, it's it's you know, and when if you've never written before, unless you're a writing genius and there are writing geniuses, there's all kinds of geniuses out there. But very few of us are geniuses. Um, if you're you know, if you've never written before, then your writing's going to suck like that's that's and, and you, the more that you do it, the better you get at it, just like literally everything else in life. And so, you know, five years after we published Lean UX first edition, going back and rereading it and having been writing weekly on, you know, uh, for five years after that, I was mortified, mortified they even published that version of the book. I was like, I cannot believe this. I mean, honestly, thank you. I was so grateful for the opportunity just to correct the grammar, you know? Like it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Well, I, I, this is such an interesting point. If, you, if I can just pause and Please. I'll yeah. be the one need to carry on, but I want, I want to make this point because I think it's so, it's so transformational for so many people. And I think it crosses, um, it crosses over into so many different people's lives. One of the things that I believe is, you know, in order to be good at anything, you've got to be, and we'll get into this, I know, with Forever Employable as well, but in order to, to improve with things, you've got to get going. You've got to make a start. You've got to build yeah. up that muscle. Yeah. I think it's absolutely right. I think the same thing about creativity. I think the same thing about so many different aspects, about interviewing people, about, you know, user research. It's a muscle that needs to be constantly developed. You can't walk into a gym and expect to lift like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first day. Right. You can't expect to be, you know, a fluid writer in a couple of days as well. It's something that is building up your craft through practice and repetition and getting in those those hours. So it's just like, I just want to make that really clear because I think that mindset is something that can be really transformational for people once they start to to work, you know, to work in or to to accept that the first thing, and, and it's a joy when you're when you're writing with the no audience because you have 
the opportunity to make some of those mistakes, right? Yeah. Um, although you had an audience and you reached an audience in, a, in an amazing way with Lean UX, still it's amazing to kind of go back and, and then to be able to correct and to, to be able to improve on those things. So if there's nothing else, nothing that anybody else takes from this, get started build start to build that creative muscle and start getting going yeah i mean you've, you've heard these pithy phrases bias for action you know you know the, the the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step atomic habits is like the best-selling book of all time or whatever <laughs> literally about this like just going out and breaking things down into into small steps um but it's amazing look it's and, and look i i am no genius writer today but 10 years later i am an infinitely better writer than i was 10 years ago because, well, A, I've written four books, right? I mean, that, and, that, and that is, that's, you know, the, those, you know, it's like running a marathon or it's, it's yeah. an achievement and I'm proud of those achievements. But also like, you know, blogging, I blog every week, every Monday, like today, just, just now, right? Every Monday, a new article comes out, good, bad, otherwise, right? And it's just exercising that muscle to get better at it. And, um, and the same thing goes like, obviously for, for the, the crafts of the craft of design and product management and software engineering, but also things like public speaking, for mm-hmm. example, you know, th- those things come with practice. Like there's a, there's a, uh, a, 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 an improvement that is evident if you, if you put in the effort. Yeah. Yeah. And actually on that one, you know, I started a podcast a good few years ago with a good friend of mine, Nick Himovich. Uh, the reason that we did it wasn't to, and it was a video podcast. It wasn't, it wasn't to publish. It was to be better at speaking. That was, that was my fundamental yeah. reason for doing this was if I can start to articulate my thoughts much better, if I can craft my sentences in a much more fluid way, if I can respond to what's happening in the conversation in a much more fluid way, then it means my workshops, my facilitation, my conversations with clients and with partners and with teams is going to be way improved as well. And so that was the, you know, that was the journey that I wanted to go with on. I just ended up publishing a lot of that work. Um, and again, to your point, incredibly embarrassed about some of those early things, right? They still exist. I'm not getting rid of them. Yeah. They will still be there for people to view in 10 years time, hopefully when I'm in a very different place or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but it's an important process to go through for sure. A hundred percent. I pause this and I, and I took us on a tangent there, but we were talking primarily about the kind of lean, lean UX and where it was in the, in the kind of uh, landscape of agile. And there was no real good solution around UX and, and design. I want to carry on with that, but I think one of the transitions and one of the other point, parts, that, parts that I was really starting to think about was a lot of that book and a lot of the kind of principles that you were writing weren't naturally on a, uh, from a, um, you know, a, a novice perspective, didn't look like you were talking about design. Because often people think about design as pixels, they think about graphics, they think about visual aspects of what you see. But actually UX principles were a lot about collaboration, about cross-functional teams, about problem solving, about removing waste, continuous discovery, um, gathering a shared understanding in order to be able to move forward much better. Um, just just help again. I mean, I've kind of thrown a, f- a bunch of things out there that I remember and whatever else, but what, what are the... How do we understand, I guess, what design really means now? And, and the, again, coming back to some of these things might, they might be really familiar for people now. There are literally books about many of those, many books about many yeah. of those principles that you coined, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a much bigger landscape now and, and it's much easier to, uh, to kind of understand some of these things. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm losing my flow in terms of the, the question I was going to ask. Design, bigger picture, you know, and and uh, and lean UX in its in its kind of position. Yeah, I mean, world. look, I, look so I I think design is problem solving. Design thinking brought that to the mainstream, which I'm grateful for. Design thinking takes the designer's toolbox, which has been around for decades, and applies it to business problems, and that starts to chip away at the perception that design is making things pretty. And I think that the more time that non-designers spend with designers, the better off everybody is. And in fact, that's where the whole Lean UX conversation has always been. It's always been about small, dedicated, cross-functional teams, the, 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 product, the, the, the trio 
uh, you know, three in a box, whatever, whatever your company calls it, right? Product design and engineering, sitting together, working on things, wor solving problems together, understanding each other's worlds a little bit better, understanding the customer a bit better, and and working towards improving an experience for actual humans rather than working towards the production of software as as the goal in and of itself. And that's what and that's what Lean UX has always been about. And the interesting thing is that, and it's kind of I, I alluded to this at the beginning of our conversation, that's a very tactical. So Lean UX v, V1 was a very tactical sort of manifesto about how to do this. As you start to implement this and you start to kind of peel back the layers of what has to happen in, in a company for this kind of work to take place, um, it gets more complicated, right? We've got cultural issues. We've got collaboration issues. We've got silos, both, both kind of discipline specific silos and products and, and, and like, you know, product uh, unit or like business unit specific silos. And, and so how do you start to break all that down? How do you build an incentive structure that moves people away from, I get paid to make a thing to, I get paid to solve problems. Um, mm -hmm. I get paid to write really great code versus I get paid to collaborate with my colleagues in product management and design to solve, you know, to make our customers more successful. That, as you start to kind of peel that away, the conversation gets bigger and bigger inside the organization. So, you know, second edition of Lean UX, a lot of grammatical cleanup, but on top of that as well, just sort of, you know, right, general writing improvements, but, but starting to really address that a bit more and, and also taking into account, you know, five more years of agile adoption and things like the scaled agile framework, which has gotten to that. And then, and then version three, which came out in, uh, in late 21. So we're coming up on almost two years now since, uh, third edition came out. Third edition was, was a, I think, a significant move forward because in the years between second edition and third edition, we put together the Lean UX canvas and it became the way that we taught the material, um, inspired by the business model canvas and, and, and kind of like the, the canvas fad of the, of the, the 2010s. Um, but no, but I, I really like, I like, look, I like one sheet facilitation tools and canvases function as, as that. And we were teaching the material in Lean UX using this canvas that we had come up with. And it made total sense to reorient the book completely around it. Like here's here how we think through the process and we'll walk you through these eight steps and then um, and then talk about the, the, the challenges of that. But really, the, and, and the scope of that, I, I think has really moved beyond um, this is what a designer should do to succeed mm -hmm. in Agile to this is how we build successful digital products and services in a, in a world of continuous change and uncertainty. I think that's where we are now. It's, and so it's a really important shift. I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's much more holistic. It's much bigger picture. It's, it's, it's putting, it's the start, I think, of putting design in the place that it should be within organizations, a, that it should have the focus within and the, and the time and the attention and the, you know, the eyes on it, but also that it's something that I firmly believe is that it's, you know, one of the things that most people disagree with me about is that I think everyone should be an expert of, or, or at least understand the design world, the design sure. thinking world design, you know, if everyone did that, the world would be a better place. I genuinely believe that that, that, that to be true. Um, I want to pick up a little bit on the canvases because yeah, there was, it seems to be every week there was a new canvas of some kind for a while. while yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan of canvases still. And I think, as you say that, that kind of um, everything on a page just seems to make mean that it's far more um, actionable. It's far more, it takes stuff which might otherwise be, you know, out there, ethereal, non-concrete, um, to, to, towards something which is very tangible. Um, why I'm interested to know, like why, although it may be the timing and because it was something that was happening so, so often is it, but is, is there any other reasons why you, you felt that the canvas was a good way to kind of represent, um, what people should be doing within, within UX, within organizations? I mean, look, it, it, the nice thing about it is it's a, it's a facilitation tool that is uncomplicated everything you need is on that one sheet and i think once you 
you've seen it done once, you can pretty much walk people through it. Like this, it's not, there's nothing in there that's, that's particularly challenging, but it's, it's a great way to get folks started, right? We talked about sort of biasing for action and breaking down difficult tax, tasks into smaller steps. This is a small step. It's a small step in the sense that you don't have to read a book, right? You, uh, you know, you don't have to, to, build a PowerPoint deck or a keynote deck about how to facilitate this workshop. You know, you've got a, you've got all the instructions on one piece of paper. You need some post-it notes and some Sharpies, which you probably have. And, um, and that's it, right. And just kind of kind of get folks together in a room and start working through this because it's not about the canvas, right. It's about the conversation that the canvas facilitates. Right. And so if that's the excuse to get people into a room, then I I've won. Right. Yeah. Like that to me is that oh, you've won. Right. It's the person who's facilitating it. Um, so I think that that's the and, and again, it's it's an easy it's an easy way to 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 teach this stuff. It look, for better, or for worse. People like recipes. Right. People t people like to be told, like, what's step one? What's step two? And so this whole like I think the agile world calls it shuhari. Right. Or, we, you know, you, you, this, this sort of beginner's mind, like you come in, you don't have to think about it. Right. So here's, here's the yeah. recipe, just follow the steps. Right. And then eventually you're going to start improvising on some of the steps. And then once you get really good at it, you throw the steps out and you run your own workshops, right? Like that's sort of the, the evolution of this. It's like, it's like the cooking metaphor, right? You follow the recipe at first, right? Second, once you get good at the recipe, maybe you, you know, you improvise a little bit, or I'm going to add a bit more salt or whatever. Right. And then, you know, by the time you're a fantastic chef, you you don't need the recipe anymore. You kind of make stuff yeah. up as you go along. Right? So I think that's that's the goal. The goal is to get people going and then and having these conversations with the right people in the room. Hopefully that gets them down the right path. That's what I hope. And uh, 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 undoubtedly, I've seen it working so often, so often. One of the things that you you, you naturally talk about so much and actually keep coming back to is is the sense of collaboration and I, th I feel like at the moment, the world collaboration has lots of different contexts, lots of different understandings about what collaboration really is from, you know, a constant stream of Slack messages or Teams messages. Some people thinking, you know, it's, collab it's collaboration's gone wild. I can never actually do my work now because I'm constantly on. I'm always getting communications. But what I think you're talking about here is a different mode of collaboration where you're talking about we're in the room, we're working on the same yeah. problem. T talk to me a little bit about that, if that's okay, because I think this, I, I see so often on LinkedIn or wherever else, things about collaborations failing or whatever, it's getting in the way, but I'm just such a believer of the power of collaboration when done well. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Right. So, so we're talking, I, what we talk about is deliberate collaboration rather than sort of like ambient <laughs> collaboration, right? Like, like these, you're kind of getting pinged, like you said, Slack messages and WhatsApps and whatever, right? And emails and, and, and all of these types of things. No, we're talking about deliberate, explicit sessions with a group of people, whether they're virtual sessions or, or in person, whatever it is, right? But dedicated to achieving a specific purpose. Right. We're going to get together for an hour today and we are going to write, uh, we're going to define the problem statement that we're solving for today, right? Or you know what? We've identified the hypothesis that we're, uh, we're going to test. Uh, so let's get together for a couple hours today and decide and design how we're going to test that, right? So what we, there's, a, there's a purpose, there's facilitation, right? There is a time box and there is an explicit goal for the session. That's the kind of collaboration that we're talking about. So it's, it's deliberate. It's explicit. It has a purpose. It has an end, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, and it has next steps that come out of it. But there's no. It's not like this. It's not. It's not fuzzy. It's not fluffy. It's not a cloud of collaboration. It's very defined, very concrete. We're in this box for two hours, and then we're out, and then mm. whatever, right? I love that. And yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge advocate with with doing what I do, which is largely around workshop facilitation and supporting teams to 
to make progress in, yeah. in whatever way that is. Maybe that's about product, but also about strategy or marketing or whatever else as well. But um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate that view of it as well. I think you're you're absolutely right. I think we want to um, fast track a little bit, but I really want to talk about some of your latest work. Yeah, I've um, I'm a, a newsletter uh, subscriber. I'm getting the weekly, you know, the next part of the OKR story that you're writing. But for anyone that isn't getting that or, um, you know, understands a little, maybe doesn't quite understand what OKRs are, can we start with some really basics? What is OKRs? What are uh, objectives and key results? Why is this important for people? And why should they kind of be taking note of the work that you're focusing on right now with them? Yeah. Uh, so objectives and key results is a team-based goal-setting framework. And it's been around a long time. It's been around almost 50 years at this point and has been used across the tech world primarily initially at Intel originally and then and then Google made them famous and then uh, John Doerr, uh, who's a venture capitalist and, and early investor in Google wrote a book called Measure What Matters and that book did very very well every CEO has it on their desk and that really introduced the concept into the mainstream um, and has made this an interesting uh, time because a lot of organizations are showing interest in objectives and key results. Now, as a concept, it is very, very simple. There's two parts to it, objectives and key results. The objective is a qualitative goal that we're trying to achieve, not a, not a, not a feature, not a metric, but we're trying to build the simplest way to order you know, home grocery delivery in Southern Europe something like that. That's the goal. We're trying to make it uh, super easy for folks to never run out of toilet paper. Whatever. Like that's, the, that's the goal, the goal that we're trying to achieve for the user. And the key results are the metrics that tell us whether or not we've achieved the goal. And those metrics need to be outcomes. They need to be measures of human behavior. So we know that we are the, uh, the easiest way to for to do uh, home grocery delivery in Southern Europe, when uh, we see you know uh, customers ordering at least three times a week, average order value going up by ten percent every month, and uh, new customer acquisition comes you know fifty percent of it comes from word of mouth referrals, something like that, right? All of those are measures of human behavior. None of those things tell you what to build or how to make it, or what it should look like, or how to design it. And that's the key, right? As a concept, it's simple, right? A qualitative goal and some quantitative uh, metrics that are measures of human behavior, which is the key, the key change there. That's it. That's OKRs, right? In, 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 but when you start to implement it, it becomes very challenging. It becomes right. challenging because A, it's, a, it's the goal that we're signing up to and you'll notice that in neither the objective nor the key result, is there anything about product, like what features, solutions. There's nothing in there about what we're going to make, how we're going to make it, what it's going to do. All we're saying is today, people are struggling to buy their groceries online. We want to make it easier. And the reason that we don't commit to features in this, in this is because we're acknowledging the reality that we don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. We don't know doesn't mean that we don't have any ideas how to do it. We just don't know what the exact combination of code, copy, design, value proposition, business model is going to be that will be most beneficial to our customers, to our users. And so we need to experiment our way into it. And that's where this gets really interesting is because the, the commitment that teams make when they work with OKRs is to behavior change, is to users' behavior change. It's not to, right, it's not to making something, like did you make the Sharpie, right? Um, it's did you get folks to communicate more effectively, right? And, and how do you know, right? How do you know? Like what are people doing differently today than they were before we shipped this thing? And so that's the, that's the core concept. Now, what's interesting about this concept is that it's simple and it's difficult because so much of our organizational culture across 
I don't like to speak in absolutes, but I'll say almost every organization, certainly every organization that I deal with is based on production. Everything is focused on making stuff. And, and look, can't be blamed for that. We've got a century of, of manufacturing history and momentum driving all of our training for leaders and managers, right? There's a, a hundred years of MBAs who have been taught to, to maximize production and reduce cost, right? And that makes sense when you're making Sharpies, but it doesn't make sense when you're running a software-based business uh, because the production of software doesn't necessarily equal the production of value. It doesn't mean you've actually made something valuable. It just means you made a thing. Mm. And so that, and that is a really, really difficult concept. And, but I will say this, and I just want to kind of tie it all together. We've talked about how sort of Lean UX version one was very tactical. And as we moved our way to Lean UX version three, it's become kind of more, uh, more broad, like kind of a whole product team facing. Um, and then uh, the s subsequent books, Sense and Respond, Lean versus Agile, and now this OKR book are designed to help organizations build the culture that supports those ways of working. If an organization sets their goals with objectives and key results and, and actually sticks to those goals, it demands, explicitly demands that organization practice some form of product discovery, right? Lean UX, design thinking, lean startup, research, design, what, what, whatever you want to call it, right? But that has to happen. And so, so in many ways, like getting to this point in, in the conversation that I've been having with, with the public for the last decade plus um, was inevitable, right? Because if we set the right goals, then we are deliberately asking our teams to go do everything else we've been talking about for the last 10 years, which is, which is fascinating because that's, that's, the, that's the connection. Look, if the goal is make an app, and have it do these three things and, and make it red and ship it by Friday, right? That's where we've been for decades, mm -hmm. right? And, and if an organization commits to those goals, a team is going to be hard pressed to practice lean UX, design thinking, product discovery, whatever you wanna call it. If the goal for a team is increase, uh, make it easier to shop using the mobile channel, right? That's the objective, right? Because we sell, you know, furniture. Okay. And it's difficult right. even on today's mobile devices to really get a sense of how this looks in my house. We don't sell a lot of stuff through the mobile channel, but we know we get a lot of traffic through that. So make it easier to buy furniture on the mobile channel. That's the objective. And the key result is, you know, amount of stuff we sell via the mobile channel, um, uh, number of people who, who buy more than once via mo the mobile channel, things like that. Right then what we've done, what, we, what the team now has to go discover how to get people to do that, right? They're not committing to, I'll build an app and I'll, it'll do these three things and it'll be done by Friday. Oh, and it'll be red. They're committing to getting folks to buy furniture online. And I, I know they've got great ideas about how to do that. I also know they're going to be wrong to some extent. And so the sooner that they can figure that out, the sooner that they can learn this is good and this is less good, they can course correct. And to be super clear and to put a point on it, changing course based on evidence is agile. That's it. Yeah. Lowercase a, right? Agility is changing yeah. course based on evidence. So to me, this is like, if we can nail this, this kind of goal setting framework, this layer, up here, in theory, eventually the rest of the pieces will fall into place. It's not that easy, but that's the, that's the plan. I love that. Uh, one of the areas I've worked a lot in in the last 10 years is in transformation. It's about behavior change, really, and it's fundamental. And I've been pondering this question for so long. Well, how does change really happen? If you think of, if you think of an individual's behaviors and their mindsets, that's a really difficult thing to change, right? Because we've had all of this life experiences that have led us to this point of these are the default ways of viewing the world, our default ways of thinking about the world, and therefore our, de our default behaviors. And 
how, what we think about ourselves, let alone what we think about the, the rest of the world, is a really th- hard thing to change. Multiply that out by the size of an organization and try and get an organization to start to shift and change their behaviors. Incredibly difficult sure. thing to do, right? Yeah. And there's so many different levers that you can start to pull. We can start to demonstrate and show great practice. We can show quick wins. We can teach, educate, coach. We can do all of those things. But actually, if you fundamentally don't have the things right that are that are measured and that are going to be viewed by the people that, that, that really matter, which is ultimately your customers as well as your stakeholders, then you're never going to be able to make that that kind of change that that leap that many organizations really do have to change so i think you know it's it's opened my eyes i think now and and i've had this love hate relationship with with goal setting you know often it feels like it's been in the past for me it's been something that's been forced upon me it's been without the proper context of understanding why you've always got that why question going sure. on but this feels like it's it feels like it's the framework that provides the why <laughs> for you um because you have to experiment you have to explore in order to get to the kind of answers that you need to get to in order to to start to make that change so it feels like having that top down you know goal setting approach which which seems so right and by the way i've had a in previous incarnations of my world and my career i've had um failed attempts at trying to bring in okrs and i think many people have sure. right yeah um and but but again i wonder whether now whether or not that's a, they, those these those failures were due to not accepting the fact that this is about behavior change and and behavior change is hard and it's going to take time and you need to again build up that muscle and build up those reps of how to do this really well and iterate through each cycle and to experiment how we do this even better and retro things in a much better way that means ultimately that it might be a journey towards getting to a to a much better in, uh, incarnation of an okr strategy but that journey is worth it the you know progress can be achieved by going, kind of going through those hard yards as well it's i, I mean look it's it's there's a lot of layers to this onion, <laughs> um, you know, because it's not just it's not just the management styles that are in direct conflict, or the or the the management education that a lot of folks get that is in direct conflict with this way of of goal setting and supporting teams, but everything that's sort of personnel related inside an organization is also affected by this job descriptions, uh, performance management criteria, incentives, awards, celebrations, pr- promotions, um, all of those things usually are based on how great are you at delivering, mm. right? And very, very few organizations ask how great are you at collaborating? How great are you at getting to know the customer? How great are you at, at admitting you were wrong based on something you learned and are now willing to do something else. And, and right. this is really where it starts to break down. This is why OKRs get a bad rep is because, you know, there's, there's a lot of like, oh, well, they're doing it, so we should do it. So And the CEO read Measure What Matters, which, by the way, a lot of the stuff that I just told you about conflicts with some of the stuff in that book. Um, mm-hmm. But um, and, and then they start doing it and then they're like, oh, this is hard. Let's just go back to telling the teams what to do. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's really difficult. I, I, I had a, had a client last year, um, a fantastic global organization that was doing a lot of great work in the world that was managed through a series of task lists. And I tried to come and teach them OKRs and it was incredibly difficult because all they wanted to do, they could get the objectives, right? They could, the, the qualitative mm-hmm. statement, you know, make the world a better place kind of thing, like whatever it was, it was more tactical than that, but that's what it was, sure. right? But then all they tried to do was reverse engineer their task lists into the key results, right? So if we launch these five campaigns, right, then we will make the world a better place. And it's like, look, I was like, launching the campaign is a tactic. It's not a behavior yeah. change, right? If you launch the campaign, what will the consumers of that campaign do differently? What do you hope to see and by how much? And and look, I'll be honest with you, Spencer, most people 
have never been asked that question. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know how to answer that question at every level of the organization. And particularly in leadership, if you ask a question to a stakeholder or a leader and they don't know the answer, typically, and again, not speaking in absolutes, but typically they'll shut down and get defensive yeah. and tell you to go away. You know? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's a multi-layered onion here. And that's why a lot of these implementations fail because I think a lot of folks look at it like, oh, objective, qualitative, key results, measures of human behavior. We got this. Yeah. Right. Easy. But actually, yeah, that, that you're, you're right. That, that leader who's asked the difficult questions or hasn't gone through a process of figuring out the answers to the questions that they think they might get asked, then there's so much going on with that person. There's fear, there's uncertainty, there will be status issues. You know, what does this, what does this mean to my boss? What does this mean to the people that have been with me that I'm supposed to know all the answers? And, and I think it's a different dynamic of leadership that this enables or that you have to start to, um, to embrace. Okay. You can have many different leadership styles that will still work, but actually that, um, that, that, that view of, I don't know the answers that, um, that vulnerability that I think is needed now. And that, you know, maybe servant leader, leader style where you're enabling people to be able to do the best work that they can, rather than telling people what to do is a big shift for enormous number of, number of, number it, of teams. It's massive. And, and, and look, yeah. there's, there's, there's another element to this too, is, is there are folks who have been working inside large organizations for decades, right? And they have, they've played the game and they have followed the plan and they've worked their way up, right? I'm, you know, level three, level four, level eight. Right. And, and, you know, this is their 25 years into their career, 30 years in, and they've got their sights on that corner office. And then somebody like me comes in and is like, let's change the goals, right? Let's move the goalposts. And it's not even like, let's move them further away. Let's move them laterally, like to a completely different game, you know? And the, the, the general response from those type of folks is no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. Yeah. That, that's not how we do things here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and like, look, no, I've, I've worked for 25 years. The corner office is right there. I can see it. It's my next move. And you're not taking that away from me. And so yeah. I'm going to sabotage this. I'm going to make, I'm not going to make this, I'm going to make this difficult. And, and that's, that's a real issue. Absolutely. It reminds me, you were, you were just talking a minute ago about the, the kind of the, the onion skin of this as well. And talking about things like, um, you know, uh, compensation, uh, how you reward, how you hire, how you fire, all those kinds of things as well. And it reminded me of a story and you're probably familiar with something along these lines or something very similar where I think there was a chocolate manufacturer recently that they were, they were um, giving their bonuses to salespeople based on the volume or the, the weight of chocolate bars, right? Seems strange now, but you know, in some world it probably made sense. Yeah, yeah. What they didn't realize was the highest profit chocolate bars are the ones that have got the most air in them. They're kind of bubbly, you know, chocolate bars, the low, lowest weight, but they've got the highest profit. The uh -huh. ones that were the least profit were the super dense, heavy chocolate bars, you know, and what they were doing inadvertently was essentially prioritizing or rewarding and, and giving bonuses based on weight, which is the least profitable part of the organization uh -huh. and the least profitable product, right? So I guess it's, you know, even at that level, okay, that's a little bit different to what we're talking about with here with OKRs, but if you're, if you're incentivizing, if you're measuring the wrong things, yeah. then ultimately the business is on a, on a path downwards. Look, we, we saw this with, with Wells Fargo, the, the big American bank a few years ago, where the incentive was open bank accounts, get people to open bank accounts. That's a KR. Right. That's, that's like the, the number of new accounts opened. Right. Yeah. Except yeah. it was supposed to be by actual humans, living humans. <laughs> right. A, <laughs> they needed to be human and B, they needed to be alive. And, and the incentive was the number of accounts you opened. So folks opened up multiple accounts for the same person, uh, multiple accounts for deceased relatives, accounts for their dogs, for their cats. Like literally it was, it was like that. Right. Yeah. And so that's another layer of this, right? How, like decoupling incentives from the key results is super important and it's really difficult. It's really difficult because we know how to reward production, right? Did you yeah. do the thing, right? And, and it's really difficult to say, well, are you closer to the customer, right? Are you making better decisions? That's a, it's not impossible, 
but it is a fundamentally different question than, you know, did you produce the thing? Uh, Jeff, that's amazing. I'm, you've definitely whetted my appetite for, for your book, for the, the work that you're doing Good. with Josh and hopefully everyone that's listening uh, this far as well. So really looking forward to hearing more about that. I do want to shift and I promised that I wanted to talk a little bit about forever employable. Yeah. This is a little bit selfish if I'm honest and hopefully other people it's your podcast. Um, get something from this. <laughs> exactly. I can do what I want. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this book, um, let me write here. Um, oh, nice. Forever employable, how to stop looking for work and let your next job find you. This had genuinely, I said this to you before, but I'll say it again. Now this had a profound effect on the way that I view so much, so many aspects of my life. Actually, I, went through a big career change. I used to be a teacher many years ago. I was uh, in secondary school, high school, kind of teaching computer science and design and all the, all these different, different parts of, um, uh, part of technology, I guess, broadly technology and creativity, but going through that change, that, that career transformation was such a difficult step for me. But when I came across this book, actually fairly recently, um, really the last uh, remind me when did when was that re- released 2020 2020 something like yeah, that yeah 2020 like, right the heart of the pandemic june 2020 yeah yeah and this was when everything kind of made sense for me because i thought about content i thought about trying to be you know create content writing whatever else of the things that i was experiencing the things that i was i was doing um but i didn't quite understand why i was leaning towards that yeah but what this book did for me was it made me realize firstly that I have some expertise that's that's quite unique to me and maybe other people have pockets of that same expertise or similar things but I have something which is which no one else has and trying to figure out what that is was a bit of a journey but once I had it I kind of then went into that process of I've got to tell people about this I've got to you know plant my flag as you talk about it uh, and then really start to get to get to the point where I'm I'm teaching where people are learning from me and this started my journey into content it's the journey that I'm firmly on now it's the reason that we're having the conversation now um, is basically as a result of of this articulating what I loosely felt was right but it made sense in a way that made gave me the kind of five-step action plan what I need to do now in order to hopefully never have to look at a job another look for another job directly um but it's also helped me in my kind of freelance career as i had and now as i'm working now towards um my own business uh, kind of agency type thing as well so um thank you firstly my for pleasure. it but great to hear bring it to life for anyone that you know i've, I've kind of given you a little bit of yeah. a view from my perspective but but why this book and um yeah and and, and what was it why did you feel like it needed to be written? So again, this this is again to be a bit tongue in cheek. There, I was sensing and responding again. So lots of lots of inbound inquiries on a regular basis uh, come in, like uh, almost on a weekly basis. Which is, hey Jeff, how did you um, how did you get the book deal, right? Or hey, how did you get a, that speaking gig? Or how did you build your career? How did you how did you learn? how to teach a, a workshop or, or whatever it is, right? And and those questions come in over and over again. And at first, I, it was one-off responses. And I was like, maybe I'll just write a blog post about the whole thing. And then as you st- start to kind of outline the blog post, it, it seemed to be a bit meatier than that. And so the response was, okay, I'll write a book. I'll write a book that answers this question with the, the you know, the, the, the essential part of it is, me telling my story. So it's semi-autobiographical, right? It's not, doesn't start from day zero. It starts from the day I turned 35. Um, and, and recognized that, well, recognized panicked is probably a better word. Uh, panicked that I may end up finding myself, um, old, expensive and unemployable. Right. Uh, that was really, that was really it, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and that really terrified me. I've got two kids, wife, you know, I, you know, we all like to eat <laughs> generally on a daily basis, you know, that kind of stuff, um, you know, roof over our heads. And, and there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure, you know, to provide and make sure that your kids have whatever, you know, the best of whatever they can, they can get that type of thing. Um, and I was really worried. I'd, I'd seen colleagues. I was 35 when, when I had this kind of panic attack. 
Um, and I'd seen colleagues who were over 40, and a 40 was like the end of the world, right? I turned 50 this year, <laughs> in case it's any perspective, well, right? But, but back then, from that side of 40, 40 was the end of the world, you know? And, uh, and I saw some, I saw friends who were older than me, like in their 40s, and they were struggling. They were struggling because they were, you know, they had 20 years experience and they wanted high salaries and they wanted big job titles. And as we know, in every organization, the further up you go in an organization, the, the fewer jobs there are by design, which is good, right? We don't want that pyramid to be inverted. Um, but when it comes to design jobs, there's even fewer leadership roles. And so the question then, like I, I the realization I made that day, and that's why the subtitle of the book is, is what it is, is I was going to change the dynamic instead of chasing jobs. I was going to create a situation where jobs were chasing me. Now, now jobs is, is, is a loose word. Like I'm, it doesn't necessarily have to mean full-time employment, mm -hmm. but the idea was how do I create a situation where I'm an opportunity magnet, right? Stuff just kind of gets, I attract opportunities, speaking opportunities, teaching opportunities, writing opportunities, uh, guest uh, pot on a podcast opportunity. Uh, maybe it's a job. Maybe, maybe it's a freelance gig, like whatever it is, but like, just this kind of like continuous inbound flow of stuff, stuff that can ultimately turn into uh, paid work in the event that when, you know, if, if suddenly something happens and, and I, I lose my job, there are always half a dozen things that I, I can pick up and start doing. So how do I create that situation? That was the um, that was the, the the impetus for this, and and the only way that I knew how to do it, and and you see a lot of folks doing a lot more folks doing it today than than fifteen years ago, was to create a platform for myself, a platform of expertise of, of as what Dory Clark calls recognized expertise, and and again, it's, it's a question of like, well, what problem do I help people solve, right, and how do I help them solve it, and then and then how do I best communicate that to them continuously so that when they have that need top of mind uh, Jeff Jeff's the guy for this Jeff's the guy for this Jeff like every time right and to me that was and, and the answer for me was content creation that was that was really where this came down to um, you know and and as you've, you've read the book so there's a lot of like lean UX practice applied in there problem statements hypotheses, experiments. Like I believe that I can reach my target audience with a podcast, right? How will I know? Well, I want to see at least, you know, 500 downloads for every episode and, you know, a 10% episode over episode increase in downloads or whatever, right? You make, but, but you, you set your, your, your goals. And if you don't hit your goals then you pivot, right? You find out why, why aren't people listening to my podcast, right? Why aren't people downloading it? Well, Jeff, I gave it a shot, but it was like, eight hours long. It's like a Lex Friedman podcast. And I just can't stand listening to your voice for eight hours. Okay, great. I'll make it eight minutes. Let's try that. Whatever it is, right? But the point is you're doing research, right? You're doing discovery. You're going out there and you're talking to your target audience. In this, in this particular case, you know, I'm selling me and my expertise. And, and that's what the book is about. The book is about how do you sort of plant, you, you choose sort of a, a, a flag to plant. What do you want to be known for? I think, I think it's important uh, to really, you know, uh, and, and to be known for something, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Like I'm mm. to be the lean UX guy, even when I'm not <laughs> trying to be the lean UX guy, you know, but nevertheless, like it's a good problem to have in that sense. And then, and then how do you can kind of beat that drum continuously in a variety of different ways so that people know that you're the person that solves this problem for them when they need it. That's, that's what that's all about. Um, and to me, that's, um, that's what's worked for me. It took me a really long time to build my platform and my audience in comparison to what I see happening today. There are folks I've seen on Twitter. There's a guy on Twitter uh, uh, who I follow. I'm not even sure why, but maybe I'm just in awe. I'm in awe of his, of his audience building skills more than anything. And I think he started tweeting to, to zero people in 2020. Wow. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. And he's got a million followers, a million and a half followers wow. today. 
right? And, and it's incredible. And he's, and he's built businesses on top of that audience, which is exactly what I'm talking about in the book. Um, but like he did it in three years, right? It took me a decade. So, yeah. um, but I had children. He only had a kid recently. <laughs> That's my excuse. Yeah. Oh, you've um, been incredibly successful. I don't think you need an excuse for the audience that you that you that you have. I think it's um, it's amazing body of work that you've created. But again, that book, um, you know, it, it helps me. It's one of the books I recommend to people. A lot of people talk to me about how can I get a career into this in this area. How can I how can I start to get a job? More often than not, I'll tell them to if you don't get the book figure out what it is that you know tell people about it it's fine in the early days because no one's listening so it doesn't matter yeah make all your mistakes even to that point of you know there's a thing called the learning pyramid where you you, you remember 10 percent of what you're told but like 90 percent or whatever that what you teach actually if you can start to teach the thing that you learned yesterday if you can tell someone about that if you can create some content about the thing that you learned yesterday it doesn't like that's just all about that kind of learning muscle and getting better and better and better at it and uh the best you know it's like planting a tree right the best time to start was 20 years ago the next best time today is is yeah. right now um yeah. so that would be a big call to action of mine is get people to to be creating more and of course we're going to see a lot more creation over the next few years but actually that human creation about what it is that you're focusing on your niche um or niche as we uh say across the pond um yeah that's that's the important thing and, and being the expert around that area means that hopefully those opportunities come to you when people are looking for a u-shaped problem to be solved yeah. that's where you that you'll be the person to come to yeah and i, th and I think the, the other thing to remember too is you know the book talks about well share your experience and your expertise and i get a lot i, I got a lot of folks in in the early days of the book that's saying, well, I'm 20 or I'm 23. What can I share? Uh, I just, I, I said, share your story, right? Like if it's your first day on the job, your, your, your day one designer in your first professional job, start writing about it. Today was day one. It was terrible. The coffee lady yelled at me, what, what, whatever, like, you know, just, but tell that story because, like, because there are people in your position who want to know that it's not just them. Right. They want to yeah. they want to understand that they, you know, the coffee lady yelled at them, too. And so it's, she, she was just cranky. You know, it wasn't it wasn't yeah. you. Yeah. Whatever it is. But like, tell tell the story that you have to tell because nobody else has it. And there's always folks in similar situations. Yeah, I love that. And there's so many, so many, so many advantages. Goodness. You know, just being able to articulate your thoughts. So, as I spoke about earlier about the, the reason I started moving into video was be able to speak more fluently and to get, a, get across you know, what's going on in my head much better. Um, but the same thing with writing. I think often, you know, I think it was it Kevin Kelly um, wrote something about, I don't know what I'm thinking until I write it. And I think just that articulation of getting it out means that you're much better equipped to be able to uh, reflect on the on the experiences that you've got, you've had previously and be able to do something positive with them in the future as well. Yeah. So all good things. Well, Jeff, we have, um, we're going over time, mm. I've just realized. Um, hopefully uh you haven't got a hard deadline and got to run off right now but i want to say a massive thank you an, an enormous thank you for the time your generosity today but also your generosity with the amount that you've given the value that you've given to people through the content you've created the books that you've written the, the, the talks that are published all over youtube and everywhere else but if there's anywhere that you would like people to go to find out more about you about your work what would be the place that you want people to kind of go and check out? Where can they find more about you? I think the two, the two most uh, important places these days uh, for me are LinkedIn. So I'm doing a lot of publishing on LinkedIn. And then uh, on my blog, Jeff, jeffgothealth.com. So please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and then the blog has a link to my newsletter, which I'd be happy if you signed up for. Um, but yeah, th those, are the, those are the two best places to go. Awesome. And go to Amazon or anywhere else to buy all the books. You will not regret it, I assure you. Um, so go and check all, check everything out. Um, Jeff, again, once once more, uh, enormous thanks for everything that you've done in this amazing time together today. I've hugely learned, learned so much uh, in the last hour, stuff that I thought I had a grasp of, <laughs> but uh, but you've, you've painted a, 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 an even more vivid picture for me and I'm Good. sure for many people as well. So many thanks. My pleasure, Spencer. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun.